Hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, third talk in this session. This is by Joy Payton and Paulette McRae. The title is Data is Not Neutral, Biomedical Data, White Supremacy, and What You Can Do. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, Paulette McRae is having some technical difficulties, so I am going to try to um, do her side of the talk as well. Um, and hopefully she'll be able to join us shortly. So um, Paulette McRae is uh, a, uh, a neuroscientist at CHOP who works in research administration. And I am a data educator who works in the ARCUS program, which you may have just been hearing about in the previous talk. So I'll quickly go over this slide. This is my colleague Paulette as a child, and I'll let her talk about it when uh, she's able to, to get into the meeting. Um, but What's interesting about this photo is that Paulette represents um, a lot of the underrepresented groups that we know are not fully represented in science. As a woman, as a black person, as someone uh, growing up in a family in which college uh, was not typically expected, she really uh, represents a lot of these groups. And this is a drawing that she did as uh, a young child, as you can see, with all of the body parts. And what's interesting is that um, she later went on to become a brain scientist and the brain is not even depicted there, which uh, we both found sort of amusing. So uh, Paulette and I want to share with you a little bit about why data is not neutral. There is the expectation that we have sometimes that our data is somehow more pure and more representative of science um, than uh, than we are, right? That somehow data is neutral. But data is not neutral. And we're going to talk about two aspects. Um, hey, Joy, unequal, was able yes. To join. Oh, perfect. I think, I think I'm here. I don't know what's going on. I apologize. Joy, thank you for getting us started. So I, you know, I think you did this slide already. So I will just jump in right where you were. Perfect. So we will be talking about why data is not neutral. And specifically, I wanna talk about two out of the many reasons that we could cover why data is not neutral. So one is representation. So that's really the talent around the table not being representative of the diversity within the population. Therefore, we're developing research questions, designing research studies, recruiting research subjects, and executing and analyzing studies where there is a lack of representation. The second point that I will be talking about is the lack of trust between the Black community and the medical community. So we can go to the next slide. So here we're looking at data from the NSF, the National Science Foundation, for science and engineering positions. On the right-hand side of your screen, you can see the percentage representation for the U.S. population. On the left-hand side, you can see the percentage within science and engineering positions. And there are a couple of things that stand out that certain groups are not proportionally represented, such as women in general, black men, black women, Hispanic men, and Hispanic women. So there, there's certainly an urgent need to close these gaps. And these gaps are present not just in science and engineering, but across all STEM fields. So the next slide, please. So in terms of, of unequal representation, I think that's something that most of us on this call are familiar with. So I'm not going to spend a ton more time talking about that. I really want to go and spend some time talking about the lack of trust between the Black community and the medical community. And this is where I'm going to spend the bulk of my time. And in, in, in part, that's because the issues around trust are often less identified as a driving force behind the underrepresentation that we see in medical studies. However, this mistrust is real and it is justified. So we can go to the next slide. So one thing that we do know is there is lower participation of African-Americans across studies, and that is regardless of the study type. 
um, as well as the type of disease that's being studied. So this includes studies on, on AIDS, on Alzheimer's disease, on different types of cancer, stroke, cardiovascular disease, and the list goes on. So what's really driving that is a mistrust of academic and research institutions and the investigators driving these studies. And that is one of the most salient and significant barriers for African-Americans and their lack of participation in these types of studies. So we can go to the next slide. So one of the driving factors of mistrust is unethical research practices. Um, and here I'm just laying out two examples. Um, one is the Tuskegee syphilis study that took place between 1932 and 1972. The other is the case of Henrietta Lacks. Um, hopefully most of you are aware of these examples and in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into detail on either one of these, but if you're not familiar, I do encourage you to look them up and get familiar with them. But these are two prominent driving factors as to why African-Americans tend to not be involved in, in research studies. We can go to the next slide. But what I would like to do is spend a little bit of time looking at some less well-known examples of unethical research practices. And first, I want to point out the term iatrophobia, which is the fear of the healer. So this fear within Black communities is real and it's justified. And hopefully, as I go through a couple of examples, you'll understand why the fear is real and why there is um, true justification for this fear. So if we take Dr. Hilton, um, he actually did a number of studies on a slave named Jim Fed Brown. Um, Jim was subjected to various experiments, including being put on top of a hot pit of smoldering coals to study the effects of sunstroke and ultimately potential remedies for that. Um, he was also subjected to blistering of his I think there was a little hiccup, but I think we're all back, right? Okay. Are we good? Okay. Yeah, um, so when we look at the cases of Dr. McDowell, he is credited as the father of abdominal surgery. Um, he discovered the ovariectomy and performed um, a number of these procedures experimentally on enslaved women. Um, and the first case done on a white woman is the one that's well documented. So that was done on Jane Crawford, but no one mentions all of the enslaved women that were subjected to experimental procedures before her. Um, the other example is Dr. Sims. So that's the father of modern gynecology. Um, he pioneered surgery that really treats some of the complications related to childbirth. But again, um, there's, there's very little conversation about the way he got to, to those successful surgeries. Um, there were a number of enslaved women that he did experimental surgeries on, one of which was Anarka. So she was a 17 year old girl. He did over 30 experimental surgeries on her alone. Those surgeries were done without anesthesia. And the driving force there wasn't because they didn't have anesthesia or access to anesthesia. It was that there was a, a prevailing belief that Blacks did not feel pain or anxiety. So there was no need to use anesthesia on them when you're doing these types of procedures. Um, he also did experimental surgeries on Black children. So we can go to the next slide. So you can say, OK, well, that was the 1850s. That was a long time ago. So let's look at things a little closer to modern times. And we can look at some experiments that were done on prisoners. So Dr. Stanley did a number of experiments between 1913 and 1951 on prisoners in San Quentin in California. Those experiments that he did included um, experimentation with sterilization, um, potential treatments for the Spanish flu, and most disturbingly, um, some testicular transplants that he did between prisoners. Um, we can also look at Holmesburg Prison um, in Philadelphia, where Dr. Kligman, um, a very well-known and prominent, um, sorry, 
dermatologists conducted a number of studies between 1951 and 1971. Um, he's actually the founder of Retin-A or Retinol-A, which you guys may be familiar with. But he did a number of skin tests for various shampoos, foot powder, deodorant. And that may all sound very benign, but when you think about the types of experimentation that were done on these prisoners, to test these types of products, a lot of times the skin is exposed to heat lamps and other types of, of manipulations to the skin to test, you know, how these products work and if they're safe. Um, he also later in his career experimented with mind altering drugs as well as dioxins, which are a group of persistent chemical pollutants. So we can go to the next slide. And to move even closer to, you know, present day, there was um, a number of studies looking at, and I'm gonna talk about one in particular, the genetic link to aggression in black boys. This study in particular um, required the withdrawal from all medications that included asthma medication. Asthma is something that's very prevalent in the black community. It included ingesting a low protein diet an overnight stay without parents. These are boys that are ranging from seven to 12 years old, um, withholding water, hourly blood draws, and administration of fenfluramine. That's part of the, the drug that got pulled off the market, Fenfen. Um, this drug is known to increase serotonin levels and be associated with aggressive behaviors. So these are just a few examples of some of the unethical research practices that have been going on. And this study was done in the 90s. So we can go to the next slide. The problem and the driving force with this mistrust runs deeper than just impacting black individuals that participated in research studies, because you can naturally say, well, just don't participate in research studies, but it's deeper than that. Um, there is and there was and there still is rampant mistruths and biases in medicine. So we can look back to 1851, where Cartwright was commissioned to write a report about the peculiar nature of the Black race. So naturally, at that time, um, he's talking about enslaved Black people. And the way he did, with, did this was um, observing them. And what he concluded was that Black people have a lower lung capacity and having them forced to work by white people was good for their health. Um, he also came up with the psychiatric diagnosis, drapetomania, which is the disease that causes Negroes to run away. So really saying that any slave that was trying to escape was doing that because they were suffering from a mental disorder. So again, that's the 1850s, but we can come much closer to present day and see a number of examples where there are mistruths and biases in medicine. Um, some including the undertreatment of Blacks as it relates to pain. So 43% of Blacks versus 26% of Whites received no pain medication for long bone fractures. Those are known to be extremely painful. Um, in addition, you may think this is just related to adults. Black children are also subjected to this lack of pain treatment. Um, so black children with appendicitis in severe pain were less likely to receive opioids than white children. The silver lining here is this is probably the driving force why the opioid epidemic is not as rampant in the black community as it is in others. Um, and if we look at a study from 2016, they looked at medical students and residents and found a number of them hold false beliefs about biological differences between Blacks and whites. Um, over 50% believe that Blacks have thicker skin. And this actually goes back to the 1850s studies where they were trying to understand the, the difference in Black skin and white skin and subjected slaves to blistering experiments. There's also a belief among over 25% of medical students and residents that Blacks have less sensitive nerve endings, therefore don't perceive pain the same way. We know both of these are not true, but again, this is, is still very prevalent in, in medical training and medical society. So we can go to the next slide. And with that, um, these are two reasons out of a number of factors that are not covered in this talk um, that are really driving part of why data is not neutral. So we, we raised the case that it's not neutral. And at this point, I will turn it over to Joy, who can talk more about where we go from here. Um, so first of all, I want to speak about the term white supremacy, which can be a very scary term for people. Um, and I just want to highlight that um, white supremacy is the term that I use and many people use because whether or not I am um, an intentionally overtly racist person, I have been shaped um, by societal influences uh, that subtly tell me that white people are better than or superior to non-white people. And this causes harm. 
So what do we do with our data? Uh, sometimes we just have to reject data because it's been tainted by white supremacy. For example, in this infamous Boston housing data set that I was given as a graduate student, um, in which there is a single variable that carries a lot of predictive weight. Uh, and I won't go into why uh, this is uh, an unacceptable data set, um, but just keep in mind, there's probably a lot of collinearity, there's problematic language, uh, and not all races are included. So the data is impoverished. But if we wanna keep our data and not just throw it out, some of the things that we can do is ask ourselves if our findings are truly generalizable. We can statistically describe our lab staff and we can normalize the disclosure of bias. And this is an R conference. So I actually did use R to look at my own biases and my own complicity in white supremacy um, and realized that um, I did a, a, a chi-squared and did a, a visualization and that information is right there for you to take a look at. Um, so we can use R to take a look at that. And I think that's all the time we have. I think I just heard the bell ring. So there's a few more slides um, that you'll get to see when you take a look at the, the slides uh, that are sent to you if you're interested in that. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. So part of the reason that we uh, stopped this a little bit early is to encourage questions and uh, and in conversation. So um, I guess as a first question, it seems so the the unethical uh, treatment. Uh, so the unethical treatment that was shown in the beginning, it seems like there's almost this movement from these you know egregious experiments to to more this this issue of neglect in terms of uh, in terms of treatment. Is that a fair thing to say? And then that that probably becomes a more difficult thing to uh, to, to to be able to point out and, and to deal with. So what are the what are the strategies for, for for kind of compensating or dealing with that? Yeah. So in terms of the strategies, I think the first thing that has to be done is acknowledgement. You know, acknowledgement that these things happened. Um, that the fear that people have is justifiable. There are also studies out looking at the treatment that Blacks receive for the same exact symptoms relative to, to whites um, going to the same position. So they're not treated equally. Their symptoms aren't treated equally. Their course of medications a lot of times is not the same. So there are a lot of inequities and we're seeing a lot of that actually play out now with the COVID-19 um, as well as the, the increase in maternal death that we're seeing in, in women of, of color. So how do you get over that? I think first you have to acknowledge that it's real. And then you have to make sure that the people that are being trained to administer or be the medical professionals are aware of this history and are aware of the innate biases that, that they have or that they may have. And once you start to address that, in addition, the other thing you want to do is you make want to make sure your medical community is representative of the community in general, right? So diversifying medical professionals, diversifying the people that are doing the experiments, um, who will likely bring a different perspective to the table. So I think those are some of the, the strategies that could be put in place. Okay. All right. So another question we have is, how do you feel about this in terms of COVID? where they're trying to push out vaccine when minorities may, may not be well represented? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, not only may they not be represented in terms of the trials, um, again, with this, this distrust within the Black community of the medical community, I think there will require a lot of convincing that this is okay, this is safe. Um, we we can look back at the polio vaccine where that was rolled out quickly and erroneously people were actually given active cultures of the polio disease instead of a vaccine, right? So, you know, we have this really turbulent uh, past with, with certain things. Um, so I think it, it really is gonna require a lot of, of education and outreach on part of getting the black community, you know, on board with with taking a vaccine. Okay, great, thanks. So, uh, so another question is that when we do data analyses, especially in the medical context, uh, a lot of times race is one of the variables that we use, and we see significance, and this becomes something that we a lot of times have to detangle. 
right? Because it, race is, gen is a lot of times a proxy for, for a couple of things. Um, you know, it can be behavior or and sometimes it's even a, you know, it's, it indicates a genetic variant. So how do you think about those, you know, when you see there, that there is significance, uh, but it's not very well ca characterized? Joy, I would punt that one to you. <laughs> a lot of the things that we can do are do statistical analyses of collinearity. Um, so which of our variables, which of our features are uh, related to one another? So, you know, it's not surprising uh, that the Boston housing uh, data set includes race, um, problematic language aside, because we do know um, that race and housing prices are related. Um, but what we have to ask ourselves is why is that? Is it um, practices that have led to the gradual and insidious destruction of uh, non-white neighborhoods through uh, neglect, lack of services, um, redlining, uh, criminalization of blackness, criminalization of poverty. So instead of just looking at race and making race carry so much weight, let's look at police presence. Let's look at how many supermarkets there are. Let's look at college completion. Um, uh, I think we settle too easily for some demographic uh, markers when we could go deeper into uh, things like the Community Disorganization Index, which measures um, a lot of different socioeconomic status indicators. Um, so I think like statistically, don't be lazy, do some feature engineering. Um, and uh, because we do know that race is important and race um, carries a lot of predictive power, but why does it carry predictive power? I think we need to go a little bit deeper and understand what are the variables hidden behind the variable of race? Okay. Thanks very much, Paulette and Joy. Uh, we're out of time now. If you have more questions, you know, you, uh, you, you, you can contact either one of them. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much, everyone.